On this Saturday night, CRA accounts locked. Concerns about hacks at Canada's revenue agency. They've also made it really easy for criminals to access this money. Will this delay tax season? An outbreak at Amazon's facility in Ontario. Why the company is appealing the closure. Plus, the growing calls for New York's governor to resign after seven women come forward with complaints. And the oldest person in Canada gets her shot. <laughs> it was wonderful. She's now lived through two pandemics. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. For the second time in less than a month, tens of thousands of Canadians cannot access their CRA accounts. The tax agency has locked more than 800,000 online accounts because login information and passwords may have been obtained by unauthorized individuals. Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, has been looking into the security concerns and what you need to know. David. Well, Robin, the online accounts were locked overnight. Usernames and passwords revoked by the Canada Revenue Agency in what the CRA called a preventative measure aimed at stifling attempted identity theft or online fraud. Saturday's move comes nearly a month after an unspecified number of accounts were locked after an internal CRA analysis revealed some credentials such as user IDs and passwords may have been compromised, possibly even obtained by an unauthorized third party. Tax experts believe that in making it easy for Canadians to get the CERB or other pandemic benefits, Ottawa also made the CRA a target for fraudsters. There's free money out there. And so the government's really made it easy for Canadians to access this money because of the pandemic that's going on. But they've also made it really easy for criminals to access this money. The CRA is already contacting affected users with instructions on how to reactivate accounts. That said, impacted users can still log in using their online banking credentials or they can create a new user account. And consumers can still file tax returns using the CRA's online net file service. But until those accounts are reactivated, locked out consumers will not be able to manage direct deposit info, change addresses or sign up for some federal government benefits. The government, meanwhile, is coming under fire for not moving quickly to reactivate accounts of those locked out a month ago and for moving too slowly to help victims of fraudulent activity on their CRA accounts. Well, I'm really uh, surprised they haven't extended the tax deadline um, with all the problems that COVID has uh, caused a lot of people. The ind individual tax filings are going to be very difficult this year. In the House of Commons Friday, the Liberals promised no consumer would face any financial losses. Uh, the Canadian Revenue Agency takes the protection of taxpayer information very seriously. We have put in place robust safeguards in place to identify fraudulent emergency and recovery claims. We will work with the victims of fraud and they will not be held responsible for any money paid out to scammers using their identity. And the CRA is also warning that account lockouts and other preventative measures are not isolated incidents and may become ever more frequent to safeguard taxpayers' information. Robin? David Aiken in Ottawa. Thanks, David. The Canadian military has been rocked by allegations of sexual misconduct in its most senior ranks. Both of the country's most recent top military commanders are under a military police investigation. The former chief of the defense staff, General Jonathan Vance, has denied he acted inappropriately. But one woman, who claims she is the victim of sexual misconduct, says the problem extends beyond the military and into the Department of National Defense. A former combat arms officer, Alex Eau Claire, is now a civilian DND employee. In an exclusive interview with our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson, Eau Claire shared her account of an alleged sexual assault she says she experienced at the hands of a department executive and the lack of support she felt when she first sought help. I tried to report it and uh, the answer I got was that because there was no, did I have any DNA evidence? Did anybody witness this? If, if the answer was no, and if you still needed a job, it was his word against mine. And so basically, shut your mouth and carry on. That was the last I heard of it again. And so I dropped it. I dropped it. I let go. And there, there, there is really nowhere to turn to. Who is going to believe me? 
I'm just a young, uh, young woman who has no proof. Who's going to believe me? I'm not sure the military police, and, and again, I'm dated, so maybe they, they're, they are better equipped now. They just weren't equipped to deal with these types of issues. Also, you lose all trust in leadership. I already didn't have very much to begin with, but you lose all trust in leadership. And on the Monday morning, I walked into his office and I said, it's never, ever going to happen again, ever, ever. If you cannot control yourself around me, I'm done. I'm, I'm like, I need a new job. And, and he, was, he was fine with that. Uh, in all fairness to him, he never tried again. You can watch more of Mercedes Stevenson's exclusive interview tomorrow on the West Block as part of Global's continuing investigation into allegations of sexual misconduct within the Canadian defence community. Support is slipping tonight for New York's governor. Several high-ranking Democrats are joining calls for Andrew Cuomo to resign over accusations of sexual harassment and allegations his administration underreported COVID-19 deaths in nursing homes. But Cuomo still won't resign. Jennifer Johnson has the latest on the political crisis in New York. The calls for New York Governor Andrew Cuomo to resign are growing louder, most from Democrats. The majority of New York's representatives in Congress, including Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, are telling him to go, but Cuomo isn't budging. I'm not going to resign. I was not elected by the politicians. I was elected by the people. Cuomo faces allegations of sexual harassment and misconduct from seven women, including Lindsay Boylan, who says the governor gave her an unwanted kiss on the lips and made uncomfortable remarks. We do not have accountability when the governor of this state um, preys on women, mostly younger than myself and then lies about it. New York's mayor, a political rival of Cuomo's, says he's been flooded with calls for the governor to resign. Andrew Cuomo! After news reports, Cuomo staffers are allegedly trying to silence his accusers. Unfortunately, what we're seeing here is a pattern of cover-up and a pattern of lies. It is unacceptable. The governor must resign. He can no longer do the job. With Cuomo refusing to leave, state lawmakers have launched an impeachment investigation. A groping allegation by one accuser has been referred to Albany police. The New York Attorney General is conducting its own investigation. There are now two reviews underway. No one wants them to happen more quickly and more thoroughly than I do. Let them do it. But one former aide believes these sexual allegations are just the tip of the iceberg. I'm just saying that it wasn't a safe space for young women to work, or women in general. Several lawmakers have called on Cuomo to resign this weekend. For now, he continues to deny the allegations while calling some of the women's stories gut-wrenching. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Amazon Canada says it will appeal the temporary closure of its plant in Brampton, Ontario because of a COVID-19 outbreak. The region's health authority ordered the shutdown yesterday. Nearly 5,000 employees are now required to self-isolate for 14 days. Since October, there have been 617 cases at the facility, but the worry is that 40% of them were detected in the last couple of weeks, and that includes cases involving variants of concern. Italians are preparing to go into lockdown Again, on Monday, much of the country will be under tougher COVID-19 restrictions. The move is aimed at stopping an alarming surge in cases. In recent days, infections have soared above 20,000 cases daily. And as our Europe Bureau Chief Crystal Gumansing reports, every effort is being made to ensure this spring is not a repeat of last year. <laughs> It is a sense of deja vu for doctors in Italy. This hospital in the Lombardy region was one of many unable to cope with the onslaught of illness when the pandemic first hit. Last spring's events are still fresh in our minds, says the Italian Prime Minister. We will do everything we can to prevent them from happening again. Daily life is already restricted in many regions, such as Campania. Naples' famous seaside walkways are empty, along with piazzas and non-essential shops. Come Monday, new strict measures could be in place across much of Italy. Regions such as Lombardy and Lazio, where Rome is located, may be shut down completely. 
The government updated the criteria for red zones to include any area with more than 250 new weekly cases per 100,000 people. The measures are expected to remain in place until April 6th. I'm worried, says this woman. My 14-year-old daughter is working virtually for school. She is losing her best years of adolescence like this. From morning to night, she is inside the house in her pajamas. Italians have been told for the Easter weekend they're not to leave their home unless it's for work, health or an emergency. The prime minister acknowledged the economic and psychological impact of the measures. Italy was the first Western nation to impose a national lockdown on March 9, 2020, confining roughly 60 million people to their homes. A year on, there have been more than 101,000 COVID-19 related deaths and national daily infections have been above 20,000. <laughs> To support hospitals, a new traveling intensive care unit is available. Eight converted train coaches can transport up to 21 patients by rail. The main train station in Rome is also doubling as a vaccination center. It was as good as it could be. I didn't have to wait outside. I was seen by somebody who could help me with English. The guy who administered the vaccine was excellent. Vaccines and lockdowns are the tools at hand. It's hoped the combination will be strong enough to prevent a repeat of last year. Crystal Gamansen, Global News, London. A British police officer accused of kidnapping and murder appeared in court today. 48-year-old Wayne Cousins was arrested Tuesday in connection with the disappearance of Sarah Everard. The 33-year-old vanished while walking home from a friend's house on March 3rd. On Wednesday, her body was found in a wooded area. Cousins became a Metropolitan Police Officer in 2018 and most recently served as a guard for embassies and parliament. Everard's death has sparked outcry across the United Kingdom and around the world. Several people were arrested tonight during a vigil for Everard. Hundreds of people, mostly women, gathered in South London for the memorial, despite police warning it would breach COVID-19 restrictions. Police are being accused of taking a heavy-handed response. The U.S., Australia, India and Japan are demanding democracy be restored in Myanmar after security forces launched another lethal assault on protesters. At least 12 more people were killed in the capital. In the city of Mandalay, police opened fire on a peaceful sit-in, killing five people. There's concern for the well-being of Aung San Suu Kyi. Two members of her party died while in custody. The United Nations says at least 70 people have been murdered since the military launched its coup in February. The true toll is likely much higher. Coming up, a word from the wise as she reflects on two pandemics. And later on Global National, a stress release for healthcare workers. The vaccination campaign across the country is picking up steam. More provinces are now expanding eligibility to younger age groups. But today, Canada's oldest citizen received her shot. Phyllis Ridgway just turned 114. And as Catherine Ward reports, family members can't wait until they can finally give her a hug. The pace was slow and steady outside Toronto's Sunnybrook Hospital Saturday. People 80 years and older lining up to get their first round of vaccines and leaving with envelopes booked for their second dose. It is like a wheel. Oh, there's an arm. Phyllis Ridgway was all smiles getting out of the car. I actually haven't seen her this happy and excited in quite some time. There has been much to celebrate as Phyllis turned 114 on Wednesday and holds the honour of being the oldest living person on record in Canada. And I'm so absolutely grateful and happy that we're able to do this today uh, and get that vaccine in her arm. Phyllis still lives in her home, so this phase of the vaccine rollout was her earliest shot at the shot. Vaccine done. Woo! <laughs> Leaving the hospital, Phyllis gave the whole process a five-star rating. Oh my goodness, I just can't, I'll never get over it. <laughs> it was wonderful. 
I asked her about the last pandemic, the Spanish flu, which started in 1918. You would have been 10 years old when that happened. Uh, oh, yes. But you know, it didn't seem to affect us very much. Or maybe I was too young to, uh, I don't know, to really remember. Memories from long ago slightly faded and replaced with matters of the day. Her family now so thankful their beloved matriarch is one step closer to protection from COVID-19. It's always very odd when I go to visit and from a distance you just say, bye grandma, you know, it'll be nice to actually just give her a nice long hug. Her parting advice to others who are considering the vaccine? If it's going to help, of course they should get it. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. Still ahead, waste not. The top chefs being hailed as food bank heroes. During this pandemic, thousands of Canadians suddenly found themselves struggling to buy food. That put pressure on food banks. But a pair of chefs cooked up an amazing concept to help, and it quickly turned into a year of remarkable kindness. Here's Mike Drolet. It's cooled down a little bit. Just pull that skin right off. Chef Keith Hoare had an epiphany a few years ago. He was teaching the culinary arts at Thistletown Collegiate in Toronto's Rexdale neighborhood. Yet he wanted to do something positive in the community. So why not, he thought, blend the two? So every month his students would get a healthy dose of cooking and learning to be a good global citizen by preparing a full meal for a youth or women's shelter. There's no way better to show that you care about somebody than to prepare a meal for them, I think. It's one of the real ways that you show respect and love. Finding ways to put ingredients together seems to be his thing. He did it masterfully when he won Chop Canada. So that means you, Chef Keith Hoare, are our Chop Canada champion, and you're going to make a lot of kids happy because you just won $10,000. Congratulations. That's fantastic. And last March, when he and fellow chef John Placco began getting calls about massive amounts of unused food from restaurants and colleges, they used their own cars to deliver it to local food banks. But it's when they discovered many of the kitchens that provide meals for seniors and people with disabilities had been closed that they really got to work. So the two chefs, along with their wives, began preparing meals and desserts in their home kitchens. How many hours a day were you in the kitchen cooking? Oh. Probably probably t 10 or 12 hours a day. It was non-stop. It was from morning till night, six, seven days a week. Yeah, it was non-stop. So we're, we're probably up at about 40 to 50,000, you know, meals that we've sent out to shelters and food banks. Between four people? Between four people, yeah. That doesn't seem remarkable at all. <laughs> Their charity proved to be contagious, and well over a dozen major suppliers stepped up to donate. It's definitely helped me um, sleep better at night knowing that it's, uh, it's been gone to a great cause. They estimate they've so far diverted a million dollars of food from landfills. As chefs, they hate to see good food wasted, but that pales in comparison to how they feel about people going hungry. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. And you can see more on these chefs tonight on The New Reality with Donna Friesen right here on Global. Up next, the relaxation station. How a Quebec business is helping hospital staff take a load off. The WHO flagged the growing issue of workplace burnout in 2019. Back then, studies showed 9 in 10 Canadian workers felt it. Then the pandemic hit. The greatest impact is on healthcare workers who've been working nonstop since. No doubt they're exhausted. And two entrepreneurs in Montreal have devised a way to help them recharge and relax. Amanda Jelawicki explains. This is the zero gravity position that I was talking to you about. Timothy Regnier demonstrates how to use his relaxation pod. It's a place to take a quick break during the workday. We are human beings, we work a lot, but we need to rest sometimes. The pod is called Recharge Me. Renier and his partner Eric Normando founded their company a few years ago, realizing the 9-to-5 grind proved difficult for many. Uh, chronic stress, uh, uh, anxiety, uh, burnout, depression, so it's, it's, very, it's very hard for everyone. So we need that 25 minutes per day to disconnect from that uh, toxic routine and to recharge. The pods are small, only 21 square feet. 
They're equipped with a zero gravity chair, light therapy, meditative music and air filters. Users book 25 minute slots on an app with strict cleaning instructions. So when I'm done, I just have to use another wipe to clean after me. They had been renting their pods to Montreal businesses. When COVID hit, they pivoted, focusing on hospitals and burned out healthcare workers instead. When you work that with that intensity, uh, you you have to you you have to rest. You need to rest. Orderly Frederick Sauve uses the pod regularly. She faces long days constantly on her feet. You go back on your day and you're already more uh, active and it's easier for you to finish your day. Regnier believes COVID will fundamentally change how people approach their work days. This level of productivity impacts our uh, mental uh, wellness. Uh, that's why we have to bring like this kind of uh, initiative into the, the companies. They hope to expand beyond hospitals, believing when office workers return, they'll need regular breaks too. Amanda Jalawicki, Global News, Montreal. No doubt we could all use that. That is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Robin Gill. A reminder to set your clocks one hour ahead for daylight saving time. We leave you tonight with a trip around the world at Toronto's Ice Fest. There are more than 50 sculptures made from 30,000 kilograms of ice. Thank you for watching and I'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great night.